Dear world, we need to talk. Welcome to Doha Debates, where we are searching for solutions to global challenges. This is a debate among three speakers with differing opinions. They share a willingness to find common ground. First, we'll hear from each speaker individually. Then, we'll enter the Mejlis, a welcoming space for critical conversations and a traditional Arab consensus building practice. Globalization in general is going through a major crisis. Globalization has been incredibly efficient and beneficial, and we need to make sure that it works for all. There are countries that are challenged by structural problems in their economy that make it very hard for them to participate in the global market. The fight in India is on against this sort of corporate takeover. We need to stop the anarchy of global supply chains that are basically leaving so many people working 80 hours a week and still destitute. Globalization is a fact. It is not a choice. What we've got to do is make it work. When you hear the word globalization, what comes to mind? Do you think of an interconnected world and greater prosperity for all? Or do you see the triumph of the neoliberal order and capitalism in all its forms? Is globalization the solution to the world's challenges? Or is it a veil that masks the real problems? This is our debate. Please welcome your Doha Debates moderator, Hida Fakhri. Hello to everyone here in the audience and all those of you who are watching us online. Welcome to Edinburgh and the third in our series of new Doha debates. So what then is globalization? If there's one thing we can all agree on, it is that globalization is a murky, ill-defined concept. We see in it what we want to see. We might see in it the growing interdependence of the world's economies, the flow of goods, technology, people and information, we might also see in it mass migration, exploitation of workers, and more wars and conflicts. Globalization is under attack, but can it be reversed? Can it be rolled back? And should it be deconstructed? Today, we will be listening to some of the very many divergent views on this topic. Then, in our majlis, we'll explore possible solutions to look at globalization to see whether we can make it work and work better for everyone. We're here at the TED Summit. We're here in the audience and live as well on Twitter. And what we want to do is hear from all, of the, all those of you who are watching us around the world. But first, let's go straight to our correspondent, Nelufar Hedayat, who I know is keeping a very close eye on what's going on and also ready to tell us how you can all get involved in this discussion. Nelufar. Thank you, Rida. Yes, uh, as you said, I will be monitoring, watching what you guys are saying across the globe. We've got people who are going to be logging in, tuning in from the four corners, and I'm so excited to say that if you use the hashtag Dear World on Twitter, uh, just make sure you use it firstly, because otherwise I can't see what you've said. If you do use it, you will be part of this debate. We don't just want the audience to have their say and vote. We want you to as well, and I'm going to be right here watching out for what you guys have to say. Thanks so much, Nilofar. I know you'll be keeping a very close watch, not just on that iPad and iPhone, but on the map of the world as well to see where most people are joining us from. I also know that you'll be joined by one of our speakers here today in our shared studios portal just outside this hall uh, to connect with some of the viewers watching this debate live in Lagos, Nigeria. So then, let's begin. Let's start talking about globalization. And I think we'll begin where many of you might expect with mobile phones. Hey Siri, define globalization. Globalization is the process of interaction and integration among people. Actually, stop right there. Maybe the best way to explain what globalization is, is through my smartphone. Globalization is the way in which businesses and other organizations operate and exert influence internationally. Take the phone in your pocket, for instance. There are one billion more active mobile connections than people on Earth with 66% of the human population owning a cell phone. The minerals used to build many phone parts are mined in Inner Mongolia, 
or the toxic waste produced by processing these rare earth minerals threatens the health of millions left exposed by China's lax environmental laws. For those in the European Union making an average wage, it costs 26 hours of work to afford the Pixel 3 XL. It would cost the workers who assembled your new phone over a month's wage to buy it. Globalization has led to the development of some socially and environmentally harmful practices, but it's done good too. In 1981, 88% of China's population lived in poverty. By 2012, it was down to 6.5%. Much of our globalized economic system is rooted in the idea of free trade. British economist David Ricardo says free trade is based on the promise of the unhindered and untaxed movement of goods, money and people. But the reality is, Goods and money move across international borders much more often than people do. And it's not because people don't want to. Now, ready or not, we already live in this imperfect, interconnected world. And whilst we can't undo the missteps of the past, we can work together to responsibly shape our shared future. Quite extraordinary, almost 9 billion mobile connections worldwide, if you can imagine that. Could there be a better example of just how globalized our world has become? To help us look at globalization from other different perspectives, we have with us three experts. Each one of them will have five minutes, and I say just five minutes, to make their case for or against globalization. Here they are on stage with me, Parakana. Media Benjamin and Sisonke Missimang. We also have with us Govinda Clayton. He, like the rest of us, will be listening to the three positions, but his task will be to apply his expertise in mediation and conflict resolution to try to find common ground, if there is any. But time now to hear from our first speaker. Our first speaker, Farag Kana, believes globalization is a tremendous force for good and that it will help spread prosperity around the world. Farag is a leading global strategy advisor, world traveler, and best selling author whose latest book is The Future is Asian. The word globalization has only been around since the 1950s. And perhaps because the term is so young, we talk about it like it's a very recent phenomenon, something that we can just turn on and off with a switch. But globalization is much deeper than that. It began the day our ancestors began wandering across the continents 100,000 years ago, and has been expanding in lockstep with our dense networks of transportation, energy, and communications that connect all the continents, nations, cities, and communities of the world. Globalization has withstood every plague, every world war, the Crusades, and financial crises. And if you look at the continuous expansion in the flows of people, of goods, of capital, of data, you can only conclude that globalization is just getting warmed up. So let's not even begin to debate whether or not globalization is our future. Do you remember the so-called anti-globalization protests of the late 1990s and early 2000s? Back then, the protesters said that globalization makes the north-south divide worse. But the truth is that globalization has been the greatest force for reducing poverty for billions of people from Asia to Africa. The protesters were wrong, and they know it. That's why the protests stopped. In fact, these anti-movements, anti-capitalism, anti-technology, anti-globalization, they always lose. They represent not universalist humanism, but very parochial short-sightedness. The truth is that too little trade is a much bigger problem than unfair trade. Too little internet access is a much bigger problem than the digital divide. You cannot simply say, Finance is evil, throw the bankers in jail, and ignore the fact that if it weren't for the global investors and asset managers who buy the bonds of developing countries, they would not have any money to invest in basic infrastructure. Let me take these two issues, 
finance and infrastructure, just to remind everyone how much more global globalization is about to get. China and other Asian countries are opening up their markets to greater foreign ownership. Trillions of dollars of Western savings will be flowing into them. Now look at infrastructure. The new Belt and Road Initiative is the largest coordinated infrastructure investment plan in human history. It's going to link more than 100 countries more closely together. It's fashionable to talk about global redistribution today. But if you really want global redistribution, then you should want much more such connectivity of economies and infrastructure. Globalization is our future. Let's get smart and let's make the most of it. Indeed, it turns out that the backlash that we talk about today is not really against globalization, but rather against the governments that have failed to manage it for the benefit of their societies. Look at the United Kingdom, United States, where citizens have experienced very little gain in median income since the financial crisis. Meanwhile, the vast majority of Asians, which is the majority of the world population, supports globalization precisely because their governments have been actively involved in steering it for their interests. As two World Bank economists recently wrote, inequality is a political choice. So don't blame globalization if your government fails to invest in worker retraining or in STEM education. Blame your leaders. Blame yourself. We do face crises that are at that are the result, the consequence, of poorly managed globalization. The environment is being unsustainably plundered. Human beings are being exploited. But the solution is to better regulate capitalism, to clean up our supply chains, not to end globalization. Let me be clear. There is no bad globalization. There is only badly managed globalization. If you want affordable education for the masses, then you want more books shipped across borders or mobile learning platforms translated into local languages. If you want farmers to survive the next volatile harvest, then you want them to get the newest high yield seeds that, can, that require less water to be distributed or given to them. If you want to solve the economic crises of aging populations and high public debt, then you want more migration of workers to care for the elderly and to pay taxes. The solution to the negative consequences of globalization is always more globalization of the positive attributes of globalization. You want to allow the supply of money, of people, of technology, and ideas to reach the demand for money, people, technology, and ideas. So remember that globalization does not fail. We do. And if you don't get that balance right, if we don't get that balance right, that is not globalization's failure. That is our failure. Thank you. Parakana, Parag, you say there is no bad globali globalization. There is just badly managed globalization. Sounds like an interesting attempt at deflection, a, a positive spin that you're trying to put on this when you I presume, and you and globalists like you know, the other perspective, the other reality that people live, people who have not benefited from globalization. Just take a, a listen to this other perspective. When you have 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 percent of people in different societies who feel as though the societies are working for somebody, but not them, you get very bad politics. People in certain parts of the country thinking everything is fine and not realizing that in you know, very large swaths of the country, people don't feel like the future is raining on them. People who simply feel that they've been left behind. Uh, are you ignoring this reality? And isn't the backlash that Anand is warning about what we are actually seeing today, the bad politics, as he calls it, the rise of the populists, the Boris Johnsons, the Donald Trumps, and so many other politicians around the world, 
who have tapped quite successfully into this growing anger that people are directing towards the globalists, toward the elites. And what he's talking about and the leaders you just mentioned of the UK and the US are exactly the two countries that I mentioned in my remarks, countries where the governments have failed to harness the potential of globalization. Think about two countries, the United Kingdom and the United States, that over the past 200 years have been among the most uh, powerful drivers, potent drivers of shaping globalization, that have actually benefited tremendously economically and in other ways, and yet their political decisions have resulted in that inequality in that sense that the majority of the population has not benefited as well as it could. But other countries that are more new to globalization, that are recent entrants, the emerging markets, the Asian countries, where governments have been much more proactive. So he's right, but, badly, and he's agreeing with But hold with on, but, but you seem to be suggesting that the politicians that we mentioned are the ones who are on the flip side, but they are actually the ones who are tapping into this anger, who are capitalizing on it. So quite the opposite of what you've just suggested. That the question I have for you, though, is although it might sound perfectly reasonable from a geostrategic, theoretical perspective uh, to reason the way you do, from a human cost, when you look at globalization and the high inequality it's created, which you seem to suggest isn't all big of a deal, when you look at 26 billion, uh, when you look at 26 billionaires around the world making as much as the bottom 3.8 billion people in this world, what do you say? Is that okay? That is also what globalization has delivered. Globalization has enabled it, but it's not globalization's fault. The interesting thing is when you want to scapegoat globalization, we have these commentaries where suddenly government disappears from the equation, right? It's this cabal of conspiratorial capitalists who have uh, you know, re-engineered and, uh, and cheated the system so that they could benefit and everyone else would lose. And government comes in at the end as this knight in shining armor to, and it's in, always enlightened and democratic, to salvage and to re-regulate things. As you know, that's not the way the real world works. But it isn't just government the government. You also have the corporations that are reaping absolutely. all the benefits, yeah, that are making more in terms of revenues, the Googles, the Amazons, yes. the Apples of yes. this world, making more in their market cap, about a trillion dollars, mm -hmm. more than the entire GDP of every least developed countries and many of the developing countries. And therefore, here's what I would like to see. I would like everyone who blames globalization for something to substitute the word globalization with a proper noun. Name me the company, name me the leader, the government, the committee that made those terrible decisions to give those tax breaks, to let the wealthy off the hook, to not, tax, to, to not regulate executive compensation. If you want to have a constructive conversation about globalization, blame, blame the real culprits because right. they are real people that's and organizations. We'll, that's what we'll try to do in the measures. But for now, thank you very much thank indeed. Thank you. Our second speaker, Medea Benjamin, believes globalization is a force for corruption, abuse, and inequality, especially among lower-income nations and peoples. Medea is a globally recognized activist who has taken on multinational corporations like Nike and, more recently, the United States government. Hello. I believe that borders are artificial constructs, and one day we might live in a borderless world. In today's world, I appreciate collaboration and scientific breakthroughs, like cancer treatments or climate mitigation. I also appreciate global institutions like the United Nations. And I love global collaboration in the arts, something that my organization, Code Pink, did just a couple of weeks ago when we borrowed the 20-foot version of this from you Brits to fly in the National Mall in Washington, D.C. when Donald Trump was giving his speech. <laughs> But this is very different from globalization as an economic system, which has wreaked havoc around the world. Let me give you a few examples, and let's start with workers. Yes, it brings cheap goods to consumers, but at a tremendous cost to workers. Corporations move their factories around the world, always searching for the cheapest workers in places that don't have unions or where they can easily destroy those unions. I have visited Nike factories in Indonesia, where workers work 10 hours a day, six days a week, making 300 pairs of shoes a day, and they could never afford to buy one pair. Globalization has been disastrous for the environment. 
Importing goods from thousands of miles away demands ever-increasing quantities of oil that have led to overconsumption that are devouring our rainforests, dumping toxins into our rivers, and clogging our oceans with plastics. Take this plastic straw, something that Donald Trump has just politicized. It's handy for sipping a cool drink on a hot summer day, but this single-use product is too small to recycle. And it's symbolic of the 88 pounds of plastic per person per year that we produce, much of it for products like this straw that we could easily live without. And speaking of junk, what about the globalized junk food like Coca-Cola, a global brand, and fast food companies like McDonald's that lead to obesity and have taken a serious bite out of healthy traditional diets? But you know what the real problem is with corporate-led globalization? It's undemocratic and it's unfair. It gives too much power to these multinational corporations that then make decisions that affect the lives of billions of people. And they destroy so many local businesses. How can a corner shop compete with a Walmart? On top of that, many of these companies don't even pay taxes. Take Amazon, $11 billion in profits last year. Do you know how much they paid in taxes? Zero. And now I want to talk about militarism, the war machine, because it's part of this conversation. Globalization goes hand in hand with militarism. The writer Thomas Friedman once said, the hidden hand of the market will never work without the hidden fist. McDonald's cannot flourish without McDonald Douglas, the designer of the F-15. So globalization feeds the arms trade, and these companies that make weapons have endless profits from endless war. Militarism puts Western democracies in bed with repressive regimes that buy our weapons. And then there's the issue of mass migration. The chaos that comes with globalization has pushed millions of people from their homes to seek employment and asylum elsewhere. And the backlash against this mass migration has led to the rise of right-wing populists from Donald Trump in the United States to Viktor Orban in Hungary to Brexit right here in the UK. Finally, globalization of news drowns out local voices and diverse perspectives. Global news organizations set the news agenda and they are driven by profit. Think about that. Now let's think for a moment about the alternatives, an economic system that is not driven by corporate profits but focuses instead on creating well-paid, meaningful jobs so more people can have better lives. An economic system that is more democratic because it's locally controlled. An economic system that puts the stewardship of the environment front and center. Let's take one very simple step together. Let's go strawless. Yes, it's a tiny thing, but it's symbolic. It puts us on the right path of thinking globally, producing locally, and reducing our global footprint. That's where our future lies. Thank you. But yeah, Benjamin, so, so you've been talking about so many issues, I think, that might resonate a lot with many people around the world. But you also said this, you said, we need to take back power, which sounded very similar to what I've been hearing those who voted for Brexit and Donald Trump say, the need to take on power. It seems to be there is some kind of convergence of interest between the right and the left um, in the United States and elsewhere. Is globalization, this broad concept, becoming too much of a convenient punching bag for those on the right and activists like you on the left who are simply blaming all of the world's ills and problems on globalization. I think people like Donald Trump got elected because of the negative effects of globalization. All of these towns in the United States that have had their manufacturing bases destroyed 
where people can't find decent paying jobs. And he came in and said, you know, I'm going to create jobs. I'm going to take back our, our economy. And that's why people voted for him. Uh, I think it was a wrong vote. I think it was the wrong response to the negative effects. I think what we have to do is take back power on a local basis and build up the kind of economies local, locally that we want to see. But doesn't Parag, though, have a point when he says that by over-focusing on globalization, we are missing perhaps uh, the real culprits, the politicians, the corporate leaders that you might otherwise be taking on, who have been pushing the profiteering that you so often decry, who've been promoting these billion dollar making uh, military adventurist uh, ventures around the world. Shouldn't you be taking them on more specifically? Absolutely, and I do every day. And I think I agree that it's the large corporations and the politicians who are in bed with them. And I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but in my country, in the US, these big corporations are often the ones that are funding the campaigns of politicians. They are the ones that are really setting the agenda and taking power away from local communities that might want a very different type of economic system. And indeed, you're right. You did take on the big corporate symbols of globalization, Nike for one, and as you say, you also try to fight for the rights of Asian workers, for example, making, what, an average of 50 cents an hour, $3.50 a day. And I have news for you, by the way. Uh, I think it was just yesterday, a pair of Nikes from the 1970s went under the hammer at an auction <laughs> in New York, fetching, well, fetching about $450,000. But isn't that reality as well? It, isn't this the free market? Well, it is, but it's the market that some of us want to change so that we have a system where it's not all about corporate profits and the corporations spending so much money on propaganda that even people from poor families will spend several hundred dollars on a pair of shoes. It doesn't make a lot of sense, except that the corporate uh, mindset has gotten into our own minds from the propaganda, from the corporate media. Um, so yes, it's the reality, but I think that reality is something that we can and must change, especially from the environmental perspective if we want to have a planet several generations from now. Certainly a paradox, which we'll be diving more deeply into during the matches for now. Medea Benjamin, thank you very thank much. You. Our final speaker, Sisonke Misimang, believes globalization can be both a force for good and a continuation of systemic inequality and injustice. Sisonke is a noted author and cultural observer whose primary concern is the intersection of race, gender, and power. So what are we really talking about when we talk about globalization? Well, whether you're from a rich country or a poor one, whether you are one of globalization's winners or one of globalization's losers, talking about globalization is often a really um, interesting way to hide behind jargon, to use what I call globalese. It's a way to say uncomfortable things while pretending to be polite. It does matter, however, in this debate where you live. So first, let's talk a little bit about people who are opposed to globalization, even though they live in wealthy countries. In Europe, in North America, New Zealand, Australia, globalization has, for the most part, worked in these places. And in these places, debates about globalization have often been used as excuses to stir up hatred and to blame foreigners for economic and social decline, right? So I personally haven't heard Donald Trump rail against the large number of Australian backpackers who overstay their visas in America. And yet he seems deeply offended by Mexicans who cross the border illegally, right? So his anger is selective. Mr. Trump isn't proposing tariffs on Swedish goods or stirring up anger about the surge in Ikeas that are popping up across the country, right? But he's very upset about China. So he, are, uh, he hides behind an economic argument to disguise a clear racial agenda. As we all know, conversations in rich countries about globalization are often just conversations about race and multiculturalism. Dropping the globalese would make it a lot easier to have more honest conversations. 
Okay, so let's turn to, to talk about people who live in poor countries who are often also opposed to globalization. As someone who comes from a cash poor but very resource rich continent with very little global bargaining power, I'm aware of the pitfalls of certain models of economic trade. There are legitimate reasons, as you've heard, to be against globalization in these places. Africans who oppose globalization are often rejecting companies that pollute with impunity, that exploit workers, that dodge local taxes in the name of foreign direct investment, right? So conversations in poor countries about globalization are often really about hunger, inequality, and economic justice. Here too, dropping the globalese would make it a lot easier to have more honest conversations. In other words, no matter where you live, talking about your hopes and your fears is a far better starting point than talking about this abstract thing called globalization. Are you really anti-globalization or are you simply afraid of Muslims? Are you pro-globalization or does globalization just work for you because your particular business is thriving and you can get cheap goods delivered from Karachi to Detroit, for example? So once we're clear on what we are really talking about when we talk about globalization, I think it makes it easier to do the most important thing. And what's the most important thing? The most important thing is to act to change things that we don't like. And of course, this is where things get a little tricky. People like me, who fly around the world to have debates about globalization, really like coming up with global solutions. Our instinctive response is to want to establish global standards and global norms, more of that globalese. We think globally, and we want to act globally too. But people live in real places, not in the global sphere. So this approach only makes sense if you define the problem as being globalization, as living in the glo global realm. But if you reject that word, then you might choose a different set of actions. You might ask people if their fear really isn't about black and brown people moving into their cities. You see, political battles are still fought locally, even if they have downstream global consequences and implications, right? The fights that will settle the future of things like climate change, those are taking place block by block, town by town, city by city, state by state, and country by country. We've all seen with the Paris, climate, um, Paris Agreement on Climate Change, global agreements are only as good as their weakest members. So if the most powerful country in the world elects somebody who's on the borderline as a climate change denier because of the state of national politics in that place, then the globe suffers. So what's the solution? It's simple. It's a two-part process. As I said before, the first thing is to ditch the term globalization because it's a smokescreen. It obscures the real issues. The second and most important thing to do is to act and to do so politically and to do so locally. Now more than ever, we have to take our hopes to the streets, to the halls of power, to the places where we live and the places we have real political influence. In the words of the late, great Audre Lorde, sometimes we are blessed with being able to choose the time and the arena and the manner of our revolution. But more usually, we must do battle where we are standing. We are living in a time in which we have no choice. I invite you all to take up the challenge to do battle where you stand. I thank you. Merci, man. A powerful call to arms, a call to action, to make sure that we don't allow globalization, as you say, to be this smokescreen that hides and obscures so many of the important things. You talk about revolution, and coming from a family of revolutionaries in South Africa, perhaps no surprise there. But when you say, let's be specific, and let's act at the individual level, let's be specific. Let's take the exactly specific uh, example of, let's say, a farmer a small-scale farmer in your native South Africa, in a remote farm, battling and competing against the large-scale 
industrial yeah. community, which is backed by all these powerful corporations, not to mention the government as well. Yeah. How can a small scale individual with very limited resources actually take on the big corporations and actually win? Yeah, so I think the first thing I will say is that unfortunately none of my solutions, none of the things that we need to do, and they're clear, but none of those things are short term. So unfortunately, that small scale farmer, the fight that they have to undertake begins politically. So it begins with mobilizing, with organizing, in ways that we've seen happen across time and space for a very long time. My country is a great example of having movements of people organize and mobilize against a seemingly indestructible force. Um, but it goes back to politics. So for example, in my country, where we are dealing with a very significant question of land, um, you need a government that's going to work for people. So I didn't think I would be saying this when I heard Parag speak, but I kind of agree with him. I think that there's a real role to be played with getting down to politics and to fighting at that level. Well, that's a good start. We're off to our consensus. <laughs> I need to do very much uh, given that to help us out. But all right, so you mentioned this, but there's also that glaring other issue that globalization brings to mind, and it is this increasing marginalization of entire communities, this invisibility that so many have to fight against. There's a specific example that I want to show you about. It's about someone trying, literally, to put his entire community on the map in Kibera, Kenya. Yeah, it makes me feel sad. When an aid is shown as, uh, as a blank spot, it means there is no there's no life in that area, but that's contrary to what uh, is uh, on the ground. People are living in that area, there are facilities that are in that area, and life is going on in that area. It's important to map this informal settlement. So the data uh, acts like a, a tool to back up your, your argument. So when you're engaging the government or even different uh, stakeholders, you're able to tell them this, this, this is the problem that we have in the community, and the map and the data is showing that. So an example of someone actually making a difference, Absolutely. taking matters into his own hand, Zach and his community. And just last night, I was trying to actually find this community on Google Earth, and I did. Mm. Because just up until about 10 years ago, it was, as he said, a blank spot. It did not exist. But so how difficult is that struggle? And how many Zachs are out there and people who simply don't make it the way he I, has? I think it's such a powerful example because it's an example that speaks to the fact that in many ways, the tool that you use is neutral. So um, Zach could have opted to use a different metric to get the same outcome. So it's not necessarily that anyone cares that much about Google identifying us or not on a map. It's about the fact that your absence there signifies um, a political insignificance, a political invisibility. So it's a great way in which you're using that as a metaphor for something that's far more important. Um, so it's a, it's a very good example of how our tools may be neutral, but our actions are super important and they always have to be political. A key word there, political, and we'll get to that, of course, in more detail. But for now, Sisonke Misimang, thank, thank you. you so much indeed. So then you heard from all three of our speakers, and before we step into our majlis, let's have a quick recap. Where do the speakers stand on globalization? Here's a quick summary. Parag Khanna says, globalization does not fail, we do. Media Benjamin wants us to think globally and act locally. And finally, Sisonke Misimang, you just heard her, she believes that we should make it concrete, we should make it more specific, not abstract. She says, stand up. It's time to vote. We need your input to find common ground among the speakers. We want to know exactly how much value you attach to the arguments you've heard. You have a total of 100 points to divide. You can divide them over one, two, or all three statements. To do so, simply assign points to the statements on a sliding scale. So then, time now to vote. I see everyone's phone is out. That's great. And as you're voting, you probably want to be thinking about, well, many things, but about the nuances and the different layers of every argument you just heard. You might agree with Parag that globalization is indeed the future, but you might also say and think that Sisonke has a good point, that a discussion on globalization is simply too abstract. We need to ditch the term.
as she says. Or you might think that Medea has captured the ugly truth behind globalization. Now, of course, while you consider your options and while we tabulate the votes, we can go one more time to our correspondent, Nelufar, who is standing by. And so just give us a sense, Nelufar, what people around the world are thinking Absolutely. about this discussion. Absolutely, Fida. Before I do that, I just want to quickly apologize to the people watching on Periscope and on Twitter. I know there have been a couple of technical faults, so if you have been watching and it's been freezing, it's live TV, I'm afraid. That's just how it's going to be sometimes. So I do apologize. Just remember that you can absolutely have your say, ask some really insightful and interesting questions, and make your comments online. Please use the hashtag Dear World in order to do that so that I can see your tweets and hopefully read some of them out. Now, I have to say, the debate is being had in the studio and our audience here is voting, but the conversation is global. I've got people here from Australia, from Afghanistan, from Gaza, Mexico, Sweden and Germany, all chiming in with their thoughts and opinions, some of which I am going to read in the next couple of minutes. But before I do, Twitter, Periscope, Remember, you are part of this vote. Just log on to Twitter. Make sure that you have the Doha Debates uh, page up. Click on the vote link and have your say. You can shape this conversation as much as anyone in our audience who are, I think, eagerly voting away, I think. Uh, now, just to give you some of those trends, Rida, we've got three main trends that I'm seeing appear. One about borders that Medea mentioned in her speech, connectivity and globalization, and also some pretty awesome one-liners that I've seen. Um, I wanted to tell you what uh, Mira in Gaza had to say. She said, people are suffering from the closure of borders. They can't travel freely. Everyone, she says, has the right to travel and choose where they live, so they can't be useful to the community they are part of. That community word keeps coming up, guys. I'd love to hear from you about that. And then we've got Khalid in Herat, Afghanistan, which is where I'm from, so I had to include that one. Uh, Khalid says, so in my community, after the globalization process, people have started seeking their rights, and women have also started to seek their rights and participate more, which I think is absolutely brilliant. A couple of tweets now. Um, some brilliant one-liners. I've got one from Omar, who says, globalization is colonization. Uh, Akbar says, globalization is a failed utopia. And a really thoughtful one from Reem in Qatar, who says, if we don't manage globalization and use it wisely, she says, to meet its potential, then we're going to stay at a disadvantage in a world that today is based mainly on globalization. So lots of really interesting thoughts and opinions. We're going to obviously have our majlis and hear what everyone else has to say. But remember, guys, use the hashtag Dear World to tell me what you think. And Rida, just before I throw to you to give the results of the first of our two votes, just time to let you know that after the debate has been had in the studio, you guys watching on Periscope can absolutely join me in our shared studio portal where we will be talking and deconstructing everything that's happened in here. So thank you, guys. Thanks very much, Nell, for that roundup. And as you say, I'm also hearing that the results are actually in the results of that first vote. So let's have the results on the screens. Let's, let's see whose position is the one that garnered the most of your votes, both those of you here on, who are online, who, vote, who are here in the audience, and those of you online. All right, so looking at it, there is actually, well, there's a very close call, a tie virtually between the first two positions. Parakana's globalization doesn't fail. We do, just under 30% of the vote. Very close to the results that Media Benjamin got with think globally and act locally. But there's a runaway winner, and I hate to use the word winner, but there is clearly, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> All right. There's clearly a position that has resonated with more people. And it is the last one that we heard. Sisonke is make it concrete, not abstract. Stand up. People in the mood for a revolution there. 41.25% uh, Sisonke. So that is the vote. And what's interesting is that later on, after the Majlis discussion, we'll see whether this vote is going to shift in any small or significant way when we you know, check the pulse one second time. Now, someone who didn't actually vote, but has been listening very closely, is our connector. Dr. Govinda Clayton is a senior researcher in peace processes within the Center for Security Studies at ETH Zurich. Dr. Clayton's research interests include negotiation, mediation, conflict management, and civil war. 
As our connector, Dr. Clayton will provide guidance on identifying common ground and steering towards bridge building and consensus. Govinda Clayton, please join me on stage. Hey guys. So, Govinda, you're here to help us find some common ground, some consensus, but what kind of consensus should we be looking for? And can we actually even think about forging consensus when, as you've heard, there are very deeply held and deeply entrenched views? There are competing ideologies, dare I say, when it comes to globalization. Sure. Well, I think one really important point for us all to remember here is that conflict and disagreement are not necessarily dirty words. They're not bad things. In fact, conflict can be a really creative process that can promote internal and collective growth. It can lead to innovative solutions and more kind of creative outcomes. So I think we shouldn't be scared of conflict per se. Conflict only becomes a problem when it turns violent, which we're hoping won't happen today, um, or leads to a kind of breakdown in communications. So I think a kind of an, an aspiration for us really is not necessarily so much to, to just find a, a consensus that, that everybody agrees on, which, which is, is unlikely to feel, to feel very natural. Instead, it would be good to get clear on, of course, the areas where we agree, but more generally, the areas in which we have disagreement. Okay, but so listening to these areas of disagreement, and I think there were plenty, uh, what were the commonalities? Was there a common thread that you can actually build on that you thought you were able to spot between the three different perspectives? <coughs> Sure. Well, I mean, I think probably as we would expect as well, one of the most consistent themes that came up through all of the different talks was this idea of economic globalization. And so we heard lots of talk of tax avoidance, multinational corporations, um, and of course, like the, the horrific levels of inequality that we have across the globe. And so I think that was, that was great. And it was interesting to hear that come out across the discussions. But what I'd really like to do is kind of echo Sisonke's point, actually, of, of moving beyond the, the more abstract into the more specific. And so what I'd really like to hear from from the different participants is really digging down into that, getting into the weeds a little bit and hearing more specifically in this area where they have some agreement and also, again, where there is disagreement. So that's what you'll be looking for? Absolutely. From the audience and from the speakers as yeah, well? Yeah, totally, from the nutshell. audience questions in particular, absolutely. What kind of questions do you think will actually lead us to build those sort of cons uh, areas of, of consensus? Sure, well, I think what, what would be, the type of questions we'd be looking for is, I mean, let's be really clear now, this is not an Oxford-style debate anymore. And I'm so, asking this more for the audience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this isn't an Oxford-style debate anymore, so there's no more winners in this, in the, as we move into the Majlis. Okay, instead, we're looking for more of a Doha-style debate. So what we're looking to create here is, is a discussion, like a difficult conversation that highlights the differences that we have, but at the same time draws out for, for everyone here and at home where the areas of commonality are, but also these important differences. A few tips can never harm. Thanks so much. Govinda Clayton. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Welcome to the Mejlis, a traditional Arab consensus building practice. The focus of the Mejlis is to welcome critical conversations and reach solutions. Hida will encourage our speakers to bridge differences and find common ground. All right, so where should we begin? So, Para Kana, Media Benjamin, Sison K. Misimang three very interesting perspectives. Let's see if we can find any common ground between the three of you. Uh, to you first, Medea, Parag says that inequality is a political choice. So he is urging all of us not to blame globalization. Does he have a point? Yes, but you get a lot of inequality when there is not enough uh, space for mobilizing from the bottom up to create the kind of changes you need to happen. So oftentimes, I've seen around the world uh, communities that are fighting for better pay, for better working conditions, uh, and they're being crushed. And they're being crushed sometimes by corporate goons, sometimes crushed by government militias, sometimes a combination of the two, but I think it's the uh, lack of ability for people to make the changes they want to see. Uh, Parag, do you agree with this? And do you agree with what Sisonke said earlier, that there is just a bit too much globalese being thrown around, that we should be more specific? Without a doubt. And uh, you know, to, to your point, Medea, it's absolutely correct that when you have this exploitation, what you've done well is to actually name the culprits. You said it is the corporate goons. It is the corrupt governments. So it's not helpful to simply, uh, you know, again, scapegoat globalization, this abstract term that means everything and nothing at the same time. What is it that is 
causing that government. It is not globalization that is exploiting those workers, right? It is, it is actually those companies. And who allows those companies to get away with what they're doing? Why are they not more, why are they not doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is actually maximizing the welfare for their citizens? If I'm not mistaken, that's why we entrust governments uh, to, to lead us, right? And so these governments are failing, and they're failing whether they're enabling this exploitation. And, but what's important is to point out that a lot of when we talk rhetorically about globalization, we're really using a, I don't want to say antiquated model, but we're forgetting that there is so much more transparency in the world today, domestically and internationally. So for every example that you have of workers getting crushed, there's also governments and workers that are standing up and saying, wait a minute, we've seen this game before. We've seen colonialism before. We've seen corporate globalization in, from the 1960s and 70s and 80s. What we're going to do now in the 21st century is we're going to make sure that we benefit. So, for example, it's very easy, so just quickly, for people to say, China and Africa is just like the British East India Company. It's the new colonialism. Well, it's not. Because if you talk to African governments, African leaders say they're saying, we've seen this before. When the Chinese come in here, we're going to make sure, no, you can't just bring your workers. You have to hire locals. You can't just bring your things. You have to manufacture locally. In some countries, it's working. In others, it's not. But let me tell you something. In the 17th and 18th centuries, these societies didn't have that choice. And today, they do. Well, let's pick on this very last point that you just made. And to you, Sisonke, I mean, a lot of obsession around the world is centered around China. As Parag just mentioned, it was the Europeans in the 19th century, the Americans in the 20th. Now it yeah. seems to be China's turn. Yeah. Uh, growing influence across the world, but on your continent Certainly specifically as well. Yeah. But is China being unfairly picked on? Is it doing anything different from what the rest of the great powers have done, not just for decades, for centuries? I think there are some interesting similarities and interesting differences between the way uh, the West has traditionally operated in Africa and the way that China in the last 15 to 20 years has operated. And I think there are uh, definitely shifts in the way that African governments have begun to respond to China's conduct. So I think in the early years, you, you certainly had uh, very um, heavy-handed tactics uh, by China as they came in uh, and essentially did, did what they wanted. Uh, and, and those relationships, I think, were very stilted. Um, as a consequence of mobilizing and organizing at a very local level by civil society organizations, and I've done this work um, in Angola and in Zimbabwe, um, there has been a significant pushback by those governments against Chinese companies. But that hasn't happened simply because those governments have decided because of transparency. It's happened because they've been pushed politically and forced by local activists to ask much tougher questions. Um, I do think that in general, uh, the conduct of the Chinese uh, in Africa and the conduct of the West in Africa is far too similar, unfortunately, far too exploitative. Media, what do you think of this uh, argument and the fact that many will point to the fact that Russia, China, and, and some others are often criticized by certainly the Western media because they are, quote unquote, not democracies, for some of the actions that they take. Uh, are we too conditioned to accept actions taking, taken by so-called democracies, the United States and others, when the end effect, the damage, might be even more egregious? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think my government has done terrible things around the world, oftentimes pushed by big corporations. Uh, you can go back to the days of the 1953 in Iran when the people decided we want to take our oil and use it for ourselves, and the British in the UK said, no, you can't do that. We're going to overthrow your government, and look what we have today, um, a fight that we might be going into the next world war with Iran. Uh, we have examples of uh, U.S. companies um, that go in and destroy other people's agricultural systems. And then we try to stop the migration that comes to the United States as a result of that. So I think that there are some very egregious examples of global corporations that, especially at this time when people are sensitive to the environmental issues, I don't think we can afford as a planet to keep going on this kind of economic system that depends on things being produced and uh, consumed from uh, thousands and thousands of miles away. It just doesn't make any sense anymore if it ever did. Barack, how do you respond to media for someone who's lived in the United States for many years, who now lives in Singapore? How do you look at these competing geostrategic dynamics? 
I think you're correct that there has been, again, this multinational exploitation, and it, but it is a two-way street. They have been operating in very weak you know, societies, post-colonial countries that are very young. Most of the world's countries were born after 1945, right? And globalization really kicked off in the 50s and 60s. So these countries had resources but didn't have the wherewithal, the technologies, the access to, to global markets to actually harness those resources themselves. And so, you know, multinationals get sweetheart deals deals and so forth, and then the, the rest is sort of history. But as I, as I said, we're moving into a new phase where governments have a lot more confidence, or at least should have a lot more confidence. You don't really see every country in the world, every poor country, saying, you know, um, here's a tax holiday, please come here, right? They're really structuring these relationships much more carefully so that they are benefit. And again, you can see this with China's Belt and Road Initiative all across Asia. Let's remember that even the China-Africa dynamic, as much as I, I agree with what you've said, you give a very balanced view, uh, Sasanki. But um, again, Asia is where the vast majority of the world population is. I spend most of my time traveling in, you know, the 45, 50 countries there, where I see every single country figuring out, calculating very precisely, how am I going to get the better, the, lo the, the longer end of the stick in this deal with China, rather than China getting it? That's what's really happening today. And that can be seen maybe as a more positive globalization that's a two-way street, rather than the traditional dynamic of superpower comes, superpower exploits, superpower wins. Sisanke, how do you see it from a more yeah. local level? So again, you know, in some of the work that we did in the Congo, and I, 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 I admit that this is a dramatic example simply because the Congo is a, is a, a country in crisis uh, and continues to be in crisis. But the work that we did in the Congo, we literally sat down with lawyers who had been hired by a civil society organization to negotiate on behalf of the government sitting across uh, the table from an, an, a number of, of, of companies looking at coltan and, 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 and titanium. Our smartphones um, are generated through power that comes from these places. So I think a point that I, I, I want to make, taking it back to like what is our individual responsibility, is to recognize that again, while the conversation may seem abstract, what's really important is to think about that thing that is sitting in your pocket and the direct relationship between that gadget in your pocket and the actions that we're talking about here, global, um, the, glo the, the global power dynamic matters on a very personal individual level. And so I, I, I definitely think that in some parts of the world and in some um, places, um, that ex very exploitative relationship continues to exist. And what's important about the fact that there are nuances, what's important about that is that we have, as Medea says, very little time. So we aren't having this conversation 50 years ago. We're actually having this conversation now with a finite amount of resources that's getting smaller and smaller. And so I think our tolerance for the mess ups of capitalism has to be, we, we can't be as patient with capitalism and with inequality as I think we have been in the past. Media, how much of the pushback, the unease that we're seeing towards globalization today in the United States and elsewhere has to do with what Sisonke just uh, referred to, these underlying issues, the underlying causes uh, that, that make us see this sort of uh, backlash, the racial factors uh, that are associated with it, the us versus them, that sort of uh, narrative that seems to be prevalent these days. Yes, and I think that um, a lot of times when we're talking about the us versus them, we can be talking about repressive governments, corporations that work hand in glove with them, and people who are trying to uh, get a fair shake, uh, save their communities, stop the exploitation of mines, of uh, oil companies, uh, and so it really is a question to me of democracy and how do we uh, democratize our societies in ways that we can see through this power dynamic that is so unfair right now uh, and open up the space for uh, local communities, for grassroots groups, for unions, uh, for uh, more people control of our economy. Tarag. I want to emphasize again that especially when you're talking about the United States you're talking about and you're talking about wealthy governments, rich countries, established institutions, democracy, rule of law and so forth, they have so much more capability to do better for their people 
and they haven't used it. Mm. You said in your opening remarks that Donald Trump was elected, you know, in some ways because of globalization. Let's be specific, right? Donald Trump was elected because the United States has spent less than 0.2% of its discretionary budget every year on what's called trade adjustment assistance, hmm. something that has existed since the 1960s and wealthy governments around the world have done. They have seen since the 1960s that jobs are being offshored, workers lose their jobs, they need new training. Now, where is the Donald Trump of Germany, of Korea? Why did Donald Trump or the, his equivalents, if they existed, get elected in those countries? Well, in those countries, you spend three or four percent of GDP on retraining workers, right? And preparing them, transitioning to new jobs, upskilling them for better jobs than just making cars. Again, it was a political choice that the United States makes every year not to spend on worker retraining. And you can just go back, and I'm being as absolutely brutally specific as possible because you know exactly what district those workers are in who didn't get the retraining money, and the equivalent of that American worker in Switzerland or Germany or Korea or many other countries did get it. So choices were made, bad choices that affected people. And again, that is so domestic in origin. You should blame the domestic poorly decisions. You mentioned also in your remarks. It's a, it's a hold on. Yeah. So are people, Sasanke, blaming their leaders in a constructive way? You say there is something actually constructive, and I've read you, uh, I've read an article in which you said that uh, citizen anger is actually a constructive thing. Yeah. But are people putting it, channeling it in the right direction to ask for less corruption, for more democracy. So in, in, in response to what uh, Parag has just said, I, I think it's such a powerful and important point. Um, and in, in many ways, I think I'm going to um, contradict myself because this is where jargon and globalese actually is really helpful because it helps us to drill down on specifics that gives people tools and arguments to make at a very local level to build up it once again um, to that national level where I think things really make a difference. And in, in some ways, I think uh, the crisis that we see in America um, is a crisis both of what you've described, but it's also a, a crisis in which, um, and here I'll, I'll take up something that you know, was said earlier, is that I think there is, in some ways, less transparency and less accountability because of the relationship between global elites and multinationals and governments, particularly, I think, the US uh, and the UK are particularly good examples, right? And so the, the neighborhood uh, and block by block organizing and the kind of information you've just provided becomes particularly important because at a national level in America, I think we see that the street is dead. We have a death of conscience, right? So politicians like Donald Trump can say whatever they want and there is no, and, and um, protesters can come. There was a time when a march mattered. It had a direct consequence, right? And the street no longer matters in politics in America anymore because of the power and confluence of what happens behind closed doors and this elitism. And that really worries so, Sanke, me. You mentioned a very important point. Is it, it, it is, as you say, the confluence of interests between the special interests, the lobbies, the corporations, and those who are actually voted into office. And you've been quite the disruptive force, Medea, haven't you? In congressional uh, testimonies and meetings and heckling politicians and the rest of it. But, but is there something to what Sisanke has just said? Can activists still make a difference? Okay. Well, they have to. We better or we're doomed. I think uh, a lot of people are seeing through this collusion that happens, and in our great democracy, how every two years, Congress people are getting elected with money that is coming from the pharmaceutical industry that doesn't want us to have a good healthcare system, from the oil industry that doesn't want us to have a good public transportation system, from the weapons industry that profits by keeping us in these perpetual states of war. And people are trying to break through that. And we have a couple of wonderful Congresswomen right now who've managed to do that and it's been so illuminating for so many people in our country to say aha here's people who managed to get to a position of power who are actually speaking a truth and so have millions and millions of followers because people are very hungry to hear that kind of honesty coming from a perspective that's not bought and sold by big corporations. So someone who sings the praises of uh, globalization, what do you think of what Medea just said? 
I think you're absolutely right that you want to have these democratic checks and balances. And again, but remember, it's not just authoritarian countries that are driving globalization. Your main culprit is democratic America, That's right? What I'm saying. So it's absolutely. not even necessarily about whether it's a democratic state or authoritarian state. It is the decision making. It's the collusion. It's you know who who benefits the most. You mentioned in your remarks actually Amazon and Walmart. So you you were talking about two American companies that are getting away with paying very little tax in America and not paying American workers a lot. In what part of that equation is globalization over there to blame for something that is utterly intrinsic and domestic to America? Because right? so, they're global no. corporations. They're Absolutely. first and foremost Go American. Well, so what? They it doesn't matter where abroad. they are. In fact, that's the point, is they could be headquartered in the UK. They no, could but be headquartered they are, in China. Walmart or, is American. And they Amazon are global is corporations but they have, but they that have are wreaking havoc. But there are consequences of they are. In, in, in our countries. Where and, are they and, regulated? And, and where I, are they I think that perhaps the biggest problem I have with your vision is one that it blocks out what could we have in this world? Mm -hmm. How could it be different? What if we didn't have uh, a Walmart or big companies that were allowed to go into any place around the world and wipe out local businesses and buy politicians and change laws? What could we have in terms of the diversity that we are losing in our world so that you have more of a homogenization going on that's actually not good for the planet? So I would want people just to think creatively and think of all the different alternatives we could have if we didn't have major, huge corporations that are so powerful. Sasanke, is that, is that the kind of honest discussion that you it, were talking it, about? It is, and, 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 and part of why um, I, str I struggle uh, in, this, in these kinds of conversations is that I want to bridge this divide, I take this middle ground between uh, a utopian ideal because we can't wish away multinational corporations. I think we can regulate them better, but we can't wish them away. And at the same time, I worry about um, uh, a view that suggests that we double down on globalization when we know that many things about it aren't working, right? So, 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 so in your opening remarks, the point was, if globalization isn't working for everybody, let's just do more of it so that it works better for more people. And I'm not convinced that doing it more uh, is the thing that will make it work for more people. Well, I don't define globalization as multinational dominance. I went back 100,000 years, and I want to humanize it in the spirit of Medea's remarks. I've talked about migration. How come in our conversation, globalization, that we, that we should be talking more about the fact that one billion people per year now are empowered to cross borders more than ever before? Empowered. Half a trillion dollars of remittances now flow back to the communities and homes and families uh, to which those people came from to support them, that's globalization too. That's as human a face to globalization as you can possibly have. And that is every bit as much globalization as the fact that Walmart is able to produce cheap things in China. And I want to talk about that human dimension. The number of small companies, mom and pop shops, corner stores, SMEs, small and medium enterprises, that are able to participate in global supply chains thanks to the internet, e-commerce, the fact that it's cheaper than ever to communicate with buyers and sellers and actually create jobs for people all over the world. That is happening right now. That's globalization too. The fact that everyone knows the name Nike and everyone knows the name McDonald's and everyone knows the name Raytheon doesn't mean that they represent all globalization. Okay. When you're singling them out, I agree with you. I'm saying that you're only speaking about a very, very you know, particular slice of globalization. It's a devastating one, it's an important one, it has more power than other aspects of globalization, but it is not the sum total of globalization. <laughs> but I just I have, to, I have to say of migration, think of the millions and millions of people who are forced to leave their countries. And I want to give an example of 1994 when the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, went into effect. And farmers, small farmers throughout Mexico were then competing with U.S. corporate farms subsidized by the US government and were not able to survive anymore and started flooding across the border into the US. That's the kind of example, I think, of globalization that shows the negative side, the personal side, the destruction of so many beautiful local communities 
forcing people to go to another country they didn't want to come to. The good and the bad side of globalization. Hold your thoughts for just a moment while I go back to our connector, Govinda Clayton, sitting there in the front row. And Govinda, just to get your take on what you've been hearing here, quite an engaged, dynamic conversation between our speakers, very deep layers of agreement and disagreement. Uh, what do you make of it so far? Great discussion so far. So, I mean, we could certainly see that everyone was really making an effort to find some consensus in the, in the beginnings of the Maj list. And so it was great to hear some points in particular with regards to obviously the problems of inequality, but also the need for some engagement with different forms of democratic governance. But I think for me, the most interesting part is what we've just seen at the end here, which is that as we started to move into talking more specifically about different solutions, the conversation shifted a little bit and we moved, we fell back into the problem of globalization being a multifaceted concept and people starting to speak past rather than to each other. So I kind of in, encourage the speakers to, as much as possible, to stay on the same topic so that they, we can kind of dig a bit deeper and hear a little bit more the source of the disagreement rather than kind of moving around to the different aspects right. of globalization. So we, we heard the message loud and clear. Let's stay on topic. We'll try to do this uh, when we get back. But before then, I just want us to get back to our phones and engage in our second round of voting to see whether this discussion so far has actually swayed anyone around the room and around the world, if it has changed any of your opinions. Let's go then to our second round of voting. We are going to revisit our vote. We want to know exactly how much value you attach to the arguments and discussion you've heard. Once again, you have a total of 100 points to divide. You can divide them over one, two, or all three statements. To do so, simply assign points to the statements on a sliding scale. All right, so while you are putting your votes into your phones, and after everything that you've heard, has the way you look at globalization changed? Has it shifted in any way? Nilufar, what are people on, online saying? Oh my goodness, I have to say, it's getting very lively on Twitter and Periscope. I think we've figured out some of those glitches. So those of you watching, I hope you've been able to keep up because it's just been absolute fire on that stage. Um, I wanted to kind of talk about some trends that haven't been mentioned. Um, and I'd love to get your takes on this, guys, because people are really concerned about the environment uh, and people are very concerned about climate breakdown. There's a lot of tweets here. Uh, for example, Jack, who is from Scotland, from the University of Edinburgh, he's worried. He says, hearing economic growth, social justice and planetary climate issues as themes are really important to him. He says, I wonder how compatible these are and how we all reconcile them with our duty to protect the planet. Our duty to protect the planet seems to be like a really important thing. Then we've got some issues of the downsides. A lot of the people on Twitter are very concerned that globalization in this globalese kind of language we're speaking, um, is missing out on the downsides and the human costs. So Rob Capretta, uh, for example, says, unfortunately, it has spread the gap between rich and poor. He says, theoretically, it is sound, uh, but in reality, it has solidified the position of economic superpowers, which I think um, makes a lot of sense to me, just listening to the debate, Rida. And then I wanted to get one of our viewing parties. There are loads of you who have got together um, in your houses or in, in, in other spaces, in schools and universities, and you're watching Doha debates online together. So hello to all of you, specifically Alistair in Sydney, if you're watching right now and you can see me. Uh, I love your comment. This is really, really important. For all glo globalization's benefits, Alistair says, the phenomenon threatens to destroy and erase local minority cultures around the world. A melting pot might bring many ingredients together, but it also risks allowing one flavor to dominate all others. That cultural aspect of globalization, that idea of sanitizing difference so we are all one homogenous group, is definitely a trend on Twitter, Rida. Uh, and then I've got a question here uh, from Karim, and this is for Sisonke specifically. Karim wants to know, what do you mean when you say act locally? What is acting locally? Um, I think I've got just enough time, Rida, to mention that there is so much more coming up uh, on the show, but that we are also on YouTube, where you should be going and subscribing to Doha Debates, where we've got so much more content, not just the live debates that you can watch, but also amazing films and videos, including Undivided, an incredibly powerful film about a Trump supporter being saved and protected by a young Iraqi Muslim woman. So head over to YouTube, subscribe to Doha Debates, and engage with us. Khidr, back to you. Now, thanks very much. It's great to get 
that idea of what the emerging trends might be online and what the specific concerns are for people watching this debate. So hopefully we'll get to these thoughts and questions in our second round of discussion with the guests, but I'm told that we do have the results of that second round of voting, and I think it'd be particularly uh, interesting here and valuable to actually put them up and compare them to the first round of voting and see whether the results have shifted in any way at all. So this was the first round of voting, as you can see, 29%, 29% for Parag Khanna and Mithia Benjamin, and the argument of Sisonki is the one that got the most votes. Has that changed? Well, Sisonki, you have just dwindled a little bit. You've gone down in, in the count, in the vote count, but the one that has gone significantly up is Parag Khanna's argument of globalization doesn't fail, we do. So obviously people buying into this argument. Uh, think globally and act locally, Medea Benjamin, you have also gone down. So I think there's more work to be done for the ladies in our second round of discuss discussions. In just a few moments, we'll be opening the floor to your questions, but before that, I want to ask each one of our guests here on stage to make one commitment, if they can, in just about 10 words or less one commitment, one thing that you think is particularly useful for you to make as a commitment for an action that you can take locally, regionally, nationally, or globally. And we can ask the rest of you and those of us tuning in online to make a commitment to using the hashtag Dear World tagging Doha debate. So Parag, what are you willing to do in just 10 words or less? Vote. <laughs> you know, <laughs> voter participation is so low uh, around the world, even in democracies, we clearly take it for granted and abuse it by neglecting it. Uh, I believe we should have mandatory voting. Uh, that's more than 10. Oh, <laughs> more than 10 words? So vote is what I heard yeah. clearly and loudly. Medea, you. Uh, expose the um, uh, collusion between governments and corporations, but lift up the positive things that our communities are doing to inspire others. So expose the collusion. Sisonke. Find one specific thing that bugs you in your community and do something about it. All right, what bugs you? So just find one thing that bugs you more than anything else and try to do something about it. That's the more important yeah. bit of what you've just <laughs> said. So thank you very much for those commitments. Uh, it's your turn now to ask questions and share your ideas with our experts. All I'd ask you is to simply raise your hand and wait until I call on you. When I call on you, please go to one of these two microphones that you see. Uh, do introduce yourselves ever so briefly, and of course, make your questions short, but make them tough. So, who have we got? Right there on the left, to you, sir. Hello, and thanks for this debate. I'm Patrick Binns from Seattle, Washington, and I'm uh, opensourcesoil.net. Uh, the question I would raise is that globalization is both a positive phenomena in terms that we see we're cohabitants of a fragile planet and we really have a lot in common. But I also see that globalization is a driver of hyper-specialization and it reduces the degree to which our countries, our regions, our watersheds are able to be self-sufficient, whether it's in food and other things. And I'd be interested in hearing your comments on how do we find the right balance between leveraging all the positives of globalization, but not forgetting that it's not just goods, it's jobs and livelihoods that we want to support. Thank you very much for that question, uh, question. Mm -hmm. Sisonke. Finding the right balance between the positives and negatives of globalization. Yeah, again, it sounds you know, really boring, uh, but it comes down to political leadership once again, because uh, the, the answer to so many of uh, things that have uh, spun out of control is, um, is sound policy and good regulation. And in many ways, what we've seen is a couple of decades of unchecked regulation, um, of, 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 of companies being able to do whatever they want, um, of, of poverty you know, deepening, of inequality widening, um, when they are very clear and specific and tested policy mechanisms to deal with those things. So the systemic failures uh, are happening and there's very little leadership in how you address those. And so it has to come back down to politics. It has to come back down to this issue of voting for the right people, but choosing the right leaders. I, I, I can't get around it. I know it's a generic response, but uh, it, it is genuinely what I believe. Parag, for you, what is you, the right balance? Um, sure, two specific answers. One is that um, you know, globalization is not some virtuous end in itself, right? It's something that is useful 
in, in the right way at the right time, right? Every government, every society should have the right to say, and does have the right to say, we're not going to outsource all of our you know, production of things to other countries. We have a right, we have a desire to maintain certain industries or jobs so that all of our people are employed. That's our number one priority, right? That's what a, that's what a democratic or not undemocratic society, what a government that cares about its people should be thinking. The other is how we price things, right? Um, you know, if you had to put a price on how much water it takes to make that avocado and ship it all the way from, you know, wherever uh, to Australia, it would cost a lot more, right? And we need to think about this sort of holistic accounting uh, so that globalization, the price of globalization is paid either by the producers, the consumers, or both. And then that will have an effect of people saying, hold on, why don't we do more of it here? What is the need uh, to, to globalize everything? Oh. Yeah, I saw you nodding in absolutely, agreement with her. Absolutely, absolutely. I love what you said. I think both <laughs> in terms of being able to uh, make your own decisions as a community or a, or a country uh, of how much emphasis you want to give to local production and also totally uh, agree with you in terms of the real costs of something. And can I just ask the audience to raise your hand if you prefer to eat local? So look, we have a lot of consensus in this audience that produce locally tastes better, it's better for the environment, and it tends to be healthier. Better than junk food, as you say, <laughs> Medea. So let's go to another question. Let's take one on this side of the aisle. Go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Kareem Abulnaga. I'm from Queens, New York. I'm an education entrepreneur and a TED Fellow. Um, what role do the political constructs and social frameworks like capitalism, communism, socialism, or democracies play in how we speak across borders when we talk about globalization? Great question. Who wants to take this one? Um, Sisonke. No. Okay, <laughs> I don't sure. want to give first. Yeah, I think it's, it's, I want to uh, answer it, but it's not first. A question. <laughs> what do we make of these? Models, uh, economic models. It's been, it's been so interesting, you know, to hear the the growing usage of this phrase, millennial socialism in the United States, and um, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders saying he's, he's a democratic socialist, and it's just incredible how even within Western civilization across the Atlantic, uh, societies that are supposed to be well versed in each other's you know discourses and politics, what uh, the most progressive American politicians are basically saying with this terminology that they're fumbling with is they want to be more or European. In Europe, it's called social democracy. It's been around for generations. And so I find it really paradoxical, strange, you know, that, that we have to, that at least in America, they're fumbling around, you know, to, to come up with words to describe what Europe has had for decades. And I think that's a testament, obviously, to what many European societies have done a good job of achieving and are struggling to, to maintain. Sisanke, just a variation on this, though. Can we ever get to that uh, equality that you were mentioning that we all strive towards if Till the US dollar is what leads us, if capitalism is the way of the world. Should there be an alternative? Uh, of I mean, yes. I, I would not be true to my revolutionary roots if I didn't answer yes. Uh, however, I, we, I, I live in the real world in which uh, I, it's hard to imagine differently. And uh, in, in some ways, the, that question gets us to this uh, uh, point about imagination, which, you know, Medea raised earlier. So, so I think Beyond the labels and what we, I think many of the frameworks that we have constructed, whether we talk about communism, socialism, or um, capitalism, uh, those words are in some ways insufficient because they represent ideological positions that existed, uh, that have existed for far too long and don't account sufficiently for the moment we stand in right now. Um, let, me, let me interrupt you there if I can. Uh, I'm being told no more questions, but let's take a quick question and let's sure. have you sure. all address it sure. and give us your final thoughts as we sure. try to wrap this discussion sure. up. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you. I'm Maggie and I'm from China. Now I'm the international student in the University of Edinburgh and I'm going to ask a question about how do you see about the so-called trade war between the United States and China and you said we're going to think globally and act locally so what are the governments going to respond what kinds of attitudes and actions should the government should take Which all right government? thank you so as you think of this of an answer to this question can I also ask you for your final thoughts, what is the best way forward? 
Well, the Correct. trade war take, will take quite a while <laughs> to, to disaggregate. But uh, look, trade is going to continue, right? What's happening is that two countries are decoupling somewhat from each other. But bear in mind, they're not the only two countries in the world. Europe trades a lot more with China than America does. And Europe is going to trade more with China, while America trades less. So don't get too fixated. Just look at the new patterns and new alignments. Because again, more countries are getting more connected to each other all the time. And this is just one particular spat between two. It's actually taking up more attention than it should. Can I just make a final plea, and I'll make it quick. Please, I know that it's, it's very fashionable to talk about inequality, but if you spend all your time talking about inequality, it, it probably means that you haven't spent enough time in actually poor countries. Because in really poor countries, even though there is high statistical inequality, as there is everywhere else in the world, poverty is still the bigger problem. So please remember that uh, you know, addressing poverty, focusing on equity, on opportunity, on what you can do, as, uh, as members of society or how you can shape globalization to uh, empower poor people is going to be the greatest thing you can do to reduce inequality, not just talking about inequality. Thank you very much for these thoughts. But is, <laughs> is globalization the answer to this? Well, is it going to reduce poverty? You can't throw that so statement it. out as the, like the last thing. And then, it, and then now I'm supposed to wrap up my thoughts and I want to respond to that and say <laughs> I, I come from one of the most unequal societies in the world and inequality drives violence in South Africa. Looking at someone, people who are moving ahead because globalization has benefited them and you're standing still and you're, we have structural unemployment in South Africa. So I think poverty and inequality are equally painful at a human level for people to live in and sit with. Uh, so, my, my, so, so that would be my response, but my, my closing comment, I think, is, is to go back to the original argument that I made, which is that in many ways the words trap us. And so I am very interested in removing the labels and in finding new, more clear, more direct, more honest language to talk about what it is that we want to talk about. And the reason we keep coming back to the wounds, to the things that are failing about globalization, is because that's where it hurts. And so it's important to talk about the things that hurt around globalization in order to be able to address them effectively. Sisonke Misimang, the importance of talking about the human, the cultural wounds. So is more globalization or less globalization? And I think I know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> what is well, I define you? globalization as corporate driven. Uh, and there is another concept, which is international solidarity, internationalism. I think that's what we need which is, as a planet, we all work to support people in wherever they're living to have greater democracy, greater say about their lives, an economic system that cares about poor people more, uh, that wants to make sure that people have the human rights, which are, include right to health care, uh, right to an education, as well as the freedoms of expression and those other kinds of rights. And I think the only way we're going to get that is if we do more empowerment of local communities and more regulation of global corporations. And on this note, we will end our debate. Thank you very much indeed to Parag Khanna, Media Benjamin, and Sisonke Mesimang. And of course, thank you all for being part of this debate. Thank you to our guests here on stage. And of course, thank you to the TED Summit delegates, our students, and the Qatar Foundation as well. Let's continue this conversation on Twitter. Follow us on Instagram and YouTube and learn more about globalization and all of our season's other great topics. Go to www.dohadebates.com to see all of our films that have been produced on this and other important issues. Let's all make a commitment now using the hashtag Dear World at Doha Debates. Thank you all very much indeed for being part of this discussion. From me, Rita Fakhri, and the entire team, thanks for watching and do join us again for our next debate, which will take place in Cape Town in South Africa on September 10th, where we will be addressing another crucial issue, which is water scarcity. But from all of us here for now, thanks very much for watching.